Hi. Hey. hey. Hello. <laughs> Hi. How are you doing? Good. Good. Nice. Uh, nice to meet you. I. I feel like we have very different backgrounds. Yours is very Christmassy. Mine is. My husband has a bit to do of a, with Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> a bit of a tree in the corner. Yeah. 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 How are you? Yeah. How, uh, how have you? What have you been up to today? I don't. The weather was a bit. Well, yeah, we've been doing. We've been training co a, a tier three style, um, out in the rain, and uh, but um, uh, we're on the, the 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 synthetic clay, which is actually surprisingly good um, in the rain. So, that's so it works the, quite well. Actually. That's the court to be on. Uh, yeah. Time of year. <laughs> What, what, is it like, what is it like to be coaching now in Tier 3? Um, well, I mean, it's not, there's not a lot you can do that's, that, that's much different outside. I mean, there's not big groups or, or, or squads. So it's, I, have, I tend to have, you know, two players at a time on the court a lot of the time or, or me hitting with a, another player. So um, it hasn't really changed that much, to be honest. Yeah. It's pretty much the same. Yeah, we're quite lucky. Outdoors uh, tennis is quite lucky at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's not too bad. Things haven't changed too much. Um, I know. I, I mean, I don't know if you've uh, if you've managed to watch the live that I had yesterday with Ollie Golding. I did actually. Yeah, that. yeah, I Which, did. Uh, who, on whom I think you know very well because you have yeah. been, uh, you have coached him at one point. Yeah. And I just wanted but, to ask you if you remember, like the first time you ever met him and started coaching him i i i do um it's um <laughs> it's a funny story because we were i was traveling with some other players at a tennis europe event in in israel mm -hmm. and uh ollie was there with his with his mum and um um you can hear them from the other side of the club um <laughs> and uh, i was uh i was just chatting to his mother his, his mother afterwards and um, I think she was having a frantic time because she was trying to work at home. She was trying to then travel a little bit with Ollie because um, it was still, you know, quite young. Mm -hmm. And um, I know we already had a group of uh, guys that were traveling that was kind of his age. So um, he just started coming along with us. Um, but very quickly, he, he just went straight past them. Um, so they had to play different grades. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's where I met him in, in a tournament in Israel. How old was he? He must have been 13, 14, that kind of age. Yeah. Looking, looking back, let's say, what do you think stood out? Like, uh, for all the, all the way he played or the way he was? Is, yeah. yeah, I mean, he was just incredibly competitive and to, to an extreme, actually. And, um, it was funny because the following year, the BBC did a documentary and followed us around. And uh, they came along to some tournaments, I think, in France and somewhere else, I think. Czech Republic. And um, I think just uh, and just how much was, he was putting on the court every time he played. I think you're slightly breaking up, so I'm gonna that, yeah I'm gonna ask you to say that again if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the the connection is a little bit tricky. I might I might have to move if it's bad. Follow me into a different room. Okay, well if it, if it goes again, you have to let me know. Yeah, it's still kind of blurry. So <laughs> so move. Let me move. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 While she did, have a little talk. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. So I think okay. I think I can hear you better now. I think everyone can ah. hear you a little bit better. Okay. Let me let me just go into the next into the next room, and we'll sit. Yeah. So while you're walking, if you can uh, if you go. can if you can tell us again a little bit about what stood out about Ollie. No, I was just saying that he was incredibly competitive mm -hmm. to, you know, to, a, to an ex extreme level. Um, you know, you, you could never imagine him ever, you know, tanking or, you know, mm -hmm. not putting 150% in when he played a match. 
Um, and sometimes it could, obviously, it could kind of overspill and he could get, you know, pretty emotional. Um, but you, uh, you definitely couldn't fault him for, <laughs> for competing. Yeah, he did say he, he had uh, some outbursts at, at times. He had a few, but what was interesting is when we, he won his first ITF junior tournament when he was, I think, even younger than Andy Murray. He was pretty young. Okay. And um, uh, we were playing at a tournament. Uh, he, was, right, we, he was playing a tournament in Sweden. And um, uh, he got to a point where he was getting penalty warnings most matches he played just because he was going crazy. Okay. And, um, and uh, at the referee of this tournament... Um, was kind of hanging around and he looked pretty uh, kind of upset. And so this match was was, was going on. Ollie was, Oli was going crazy. He hadn't had a warning yet. And I said to the referee, look, can you come to this match and just give this guy a, a warning? And he said, what? Um, so are you the coach of the, this other player? I said, no, no, no. The guy, that I, the guy I'm coaching is the one I give, want you to give the warning to. Because every time he had a warning, he just calmed straight down. So as soon as he had his warning, he was fine, and then he carried on and concentrated, and and, and he actually won the tournament in the end. Did he so, ever know uh, you? Did he ever know you asked for for the? I don't award? think so. I did. I did it about. A bit, I did it about two or three times. I think. Okay. I don't think I ever told him that. I think he'd be a bit upset. <laughs> yeah, I think he. Yeah. I think it's long gone now. So maybe he'll. Just yeah, have yeah, yeah. It. No, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Okay. Um, tell tell us a little bit about because you've been. You've been coaching quite, diff let's say, a range of ages, right? Yeah. Um, so what are you most familiar with? What age are you most familiar with? And why did you I, do I guess, that? Yeah, I, I guess um, probably the, the range mainly I've been working with is sort of 16 to early 20s, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, when I was first started coaching probably full time was at Sutton mm -hmm. um, when and, it, and that was before it became a LTA National Training Center. Um, and that would have been by me early 90s. Um, and, uh, and the scholarship program had just started. And of course, it was for sick formers. So they tend to be that age. Um, and gradually the players, you know, got better and then better players came and, um, and yeah, it started a full-time squad and it really carried on from there, really. How come you, let's say, stuck to that particular age or stage in the player's career? Yeah, it was interesting because I was very late to tennis myself playing mm -hmm. and you, you're always kind of playing catch-up in terms of level. I've always kind of felt sorry for the kind of 16 plus players who tend to get ignored um, because there's this thought that, you know, if you haven't made, you know, a, a big national, international mark by the time you're 14, then, you know, you might as well give up, which it isn't, you know, which isn't true. And there's lots of latecomers into, into tennis that do very well. So, um, uh, you know, ha having those players, um, you know, have the opportunity to keep competing and understand what they can do playing team tennis, um, et cetera, and then, you know, try and get into an American um, college. Um, you know, to have, for them to have the chance to do it, I think is, I think it was really important. And it's just been always been a really interesting age group. When you're working with someone who's very good when they're 10, they might be very good, but they're so early in their journey, they've got absolutely no idea where they're going to be at the end of it. How come? I think yeah. a lot of people, I was talking to Ollie about it as well. A lot of people have this expectations, let's say, when they see a very good junior, they expect that junior to, you know, fulfill the expectations when, yeah. when they turn 18, 20 and so on. And if that doesn't happen, then, you know, they're like, okay, maybe that person should just stop playing. Or why, mm. why do you think there's, such a gap between how a player or the level that a player is at when they're 12, 14 and the age of 18 or 20. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a big gap to try and um, cross over because, um, you know, juniors can, can look amazing and hit the ball great. Um, and then they play someone who's in their mid, late 20s or in 30s 
who who doesn't hit the ball as well as they do and they get completely outplayed and that experience of of knowing how to play points knowing how to compete um that mental strength that comes from comes from you know competing over and over again at an older age group makes such a big difference and it takes juniors quite a long time even the best players in the world um taking their time to then get through futures and then and then into challenges so it's a really you can you know you can hit the ball amazingly well but it's it's getting harder and harder for juniors to to bridge that gap which is why it's a you know it's it's it's, it's a long process and they need that time um you know to go through it when do you think a player matures well i remember seeing stats years and years ago when they were looking at players top 100 players how old they were when they had their best rankings and i think for for men i mean when i say years ago i mean the 90s so um for 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 men i think it was 28 and for women i think it was about 25 but that's increased an awful lot now i think that you're probably looking you know uh, women may be late 20s and men may be 30 30 32 when you're probably at your physical and mental peak to play but players of course give up long before they even get anywhere near that kind of age um why do you so think they give up just, um i think i think the uk is a kind of a it's quite a unique place for tennis um in uh, uh the experiences i've had in 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 eastern europe um where i remember talking to some uh, referees at a, a tournament in serbia and um the serbian federation seemed to spend all their money on tennis europe tournaments and 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 events get their kids to get as high the highest ranking they possibly can mm-hmm. and then they send them to to academies in in western europe in italy and in germany um and then in western europe and italy is a real big one recently but in germany and france and italy the domestically it's incredibly strong so you have players that are playing semi pro for a very long time the uk doesn't fit into either of those two categories because you know you got easy access to very good education good to a good career so if things are kind of tough for you you know it's easy just to to jump out jump out there um uh so it's 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 i think it's odd in this country and i think there's a there's a big drop out because of that yeah that's that's quite interesting because yeah like you say you have the option of studying and then getting a good job probably yeah and then yeah, absolutely having yeah. a decent lifestyle yeah. as, whereas in other countries there are not so um great economically yeah. speaking then tennis would be kind of their only chance or maybe yeah. not their only chance but a you know that would be their main thing absolutely and i think for for girls especially um uh i think in eastern europe for, for, for girls they feel like um they don't have the same kind of options um so there tends to be a tends to be a, an awful lot of them um that 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 that's right i used to work with a with a, a georgian girl and her capacity for training was just incredible How would never come compared up. to let's say someone that would uh would have lived here in the UK what was the difference I mean it's not like to sort of generalize and everybody is is, is different but I, I feel like I mean she had a very very strong um mother figure who um I don't know how we talked to each other because she didn't speak a word of English but um uh and and you know she was very incredibly hard on her daughter and very disciplined but um you know this girl, uh, girl this girl's called Marion Bolt Badsey you know if you you know her um uh but i first met her when she was 12 13 and she really was not strong at all she would be losing and uh, she lost in the first round of westway grade 3 okay. and a grade 3 tournament when she was i was about 12 13 and last year she made the second round of the us open losing to pliskova so um but her ability to work was extraordinary it really was the, the commitment would be more long term maybe long term and 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 total you know her commitment was absolutely you know unquestioned it was just down to how long her visa would last for really more than anything else mm-hmm. what 
what is it like for a coach to kind of anticipate uh, that very long transitioning phase? I mean, let's say you have a very good junior and how do you manage your own expectations or your, let's say, goals as a coach? How do you get the patience for that? Yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully your goal is kind of coming second to the to, to the players' goals because ultimately, you know, their success is kind of everybody else's. Um, and uh, you, it's, it's difficult because you can't you can't force it. Um, uh, they're going to be able to to to, to come through or, or they're not, and and whether they do or not really comes down to ultimately their their motivation, their personality. Because by that time, if they're already a top junior, they're good enough. They're already good enough. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's how they move on move on from there is down to is down to their you know their desire and their willpower and um, you know how much they how much they're willing to put themselves through. Because it can be quite you know, stressful. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, and it's a it's a very long period to anticipate actually. And yeah. Yeah. To, to manage and to anticipate. Um, what would you look for in a player, a junior? Um, yeah, what would you look for in someone that you think uh, could be a very good senior player or could do very well at a senior level? Uh, to, to start with, personality. So I think a player's personality is... Is is by far the most important thing. What's and then if we talk, um, single-minded, determined. Um, uh, sometimes they tend to be quite serious. The girls who I've known who've been very good are, are are quite serious and maybe don't have the same kind of popular friend group. You know, sometimes you go to all the tournaments, you see lots of girls, you know, having a great time together, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but maybe they're thinking about, you know, they're having more of a holiday than they are, you know, they're prepared to do a job. And, um, you know, the girls that are, the, that are very serious, you can, you can spot them a mile off, you know, on their own, doing their own thing, doing their warm up, focusing. Um, so that, that, that personality trait is most important. From a, from a game point of view, I think it's people who have something in their game where they can win easy points. And um, and they can be particularly effective, and that can be all sorts of things. Uh, um, a girl I worked with years ago, a British girl who who actually didn't have any ITF points, but she had quite a high rating, so she got into Wimbledon Junior Qualies, okay. and she really couldn't hit over a backhand very well, so she just sliced everything, and she managed to qualify, beating a lot of the national squad girls on the way, just hitting great slice backhands. And it, on those horrible grass courts that they had, it just happened to be particularly effective. Mm -hmm. you know, she wasn't the greatest player in the world, but she'd hit two slice backhands cross court and didn't bounce. Um, so uh, as long as you're effective, or it could be a, mm -hmm. somebody who's six foot six with a 135 serve yeah. um, or a big serve, big forehand combination. But anywhere where you see someone use winning points on a regular basis the same way every time would you say that maybe winning let's say a bigger tournament um when you're a junior is more down to luck let's say or just chance maybe um, more than it is in a senior yeah, it's, level, it's, not, it's yeah i mean it's not i don't know if it's chance i mean clearly you've got to be you've got to be good enough you know, to, to do it in the first place. And there are some juniors that are headed in shoulders. And you go through the years, the first junior, I mean, it shows how old I am, but the first juniors I remember was um, when Federer won Junior Wimbledon. Okay? That was my first experience of, of, of having players at Junior Wimbledon. Um, and, uh, you know, you you didn't really know how good these players were were going to be but um uh, yeah i mean it's but could you see know, something? And, and do you know what i've sort of well federer played 
Dave Sherwood, I don't even remember a guy called Dave Sherwood, British player, um, who, you know, kind of didn't fulfil his potential and gave up. But, um, you know, it was it was a tight match and Federer won in, in three sets, but I, I thought that Sherwood could have beaten him. But the trouble is, when you're watching Federer when he's 18 years old, he, you don't know he's Roger Federer. Um, and then another guy, um, I think Matt Trudgeon beat Roddick. Mm-hmm. It was the same year. I think Roddick was number one in the world at the time, beat Roddick. Um, but then Roddick didn't serve the way he serves, you know, you know, served later on in his career and and uh, things are different. So, yeah, it was it was hard to tell. The only guy that looked really good was the guy that beat him the second round, which was um, Guillermo Correa. Okay, yeah. He was a genius. He was he was amazing. But when you look back at all those years, there were two standout numbers, and that was Monfi and... Um, and Kyrgios, they were they what were better than everybody there? else. What, what do you think happened there? Because you know we can all see how good they are, the type of athletes they are, how talented mm. they are, and so on. But somehow it didn't. Happen. Do you know what? I, I kind of people were expecting them to. Yeah, I kind of think that in juniors, if you're very, 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 very good, and I mean very good, um, you, it all feels a little bit too easy. Hmm. A little bit. And then you lose that kind of sense of a sense of discipline. Someone like Dominic Thiem, who was in Ollie's year, was clearly very good junior. But he was a little bit of a step back from Ollie and, um, and Vesely. Because really? Ollie and Vesely could hit through everybody. So... Um, but I've never seen any any of the juniors out of all the juniors in that year. Dominic team worked by far the hardest. His work rate uh, with all those guys was just you know was was incredible. And he'd be on the you know practice court afterwards and just churning and churning and churning and churning. And mentally he was you know he was rock solid. And you just thought this is you know it's a matter of time before this guy starts to you know do whatever he wants to do really. Yeah, you can actually see it now. I mean. Yeah, it's paid off, isn't it? And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's very good. But um, let's see, what, the, apart from the fact that maybe when you're a very good junior, you just get maybe comfortable because it is too easy at one point, you know, to yeah. win. What do you think are other reasons for which they don't really uh, transfer to that senior level? I, I think I think um, there's all sorts of reasons, isn't there? There's there's you know there's lack of opportunity, there's 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 lack of money, um, there's a, there's a drop in desire. There may be um, uh, a game that you have that's been effective in juniors, but is not translating into seniors. So say in juniors you've got a guy that never misses, and there's you know it, it's rock solid, um, and you can you can break people down. Um, the trouble is when you step up, especially to challenges where everybody's hitting the ball and they're not missing, well, you're not missing is no longer any good anymore mm-hmm. because it's just, it's just not doing any damage. So, you know, if you, like they say, if you can control the most points in the match and you make the least mistakes, then, then you're going to win. Mm-hmm. But of course that's very difficult to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's still the case now? At the um, level people are playing, or do you also have to have, you know, a big shot or a couple of big shots that you can actually? Yeah, play? and if and if you've got a big shot, then it's easier to control the point and easier to control the court. Whether it's off your serve or forehand, if you've got a, a big shot, then um, you you know you can stay in control. And if you if you can stay in control without taking risks then you're not going to miss as much. So if you're in control and you're not missing, then you're pretty hard to, you hit pretty hard to beat. And when you're watching, you know, obviously Nadal and Djokovic and Federer, it, they're so comfortable being in control of points that, it, that it's, it's really very difficult to do anything about it. You can have a go. There's been some guys who have stepped on court against Nadal and thought, right, I'm just going to hit through him. And they can maybe do it for a few games, but but really you're fighting against the tide because 
you know, he, he soaks it up and eventually you can't keep it up and you just break down. Um, so it's, uh, you know, that skill is incredibly impressive. Yeah, I think uh, Ollie was saying yesterday, if you've seen that at one point he was uh, playing some sets against Andy and he said that it was very difficult to actually find the weakness. Well, because he doesn't have one. Very yeah. <laughs> From yeah. the beginning and after three games, he was a little bit like, okay, what can yeah. I do? I have to do this for three sets and it's too much. Yeah, I mean, if you think that if you think you're playing someone like Andy Murray, you think, well, if I want to win a point, then I'm going to have to hit a winner, mm -hmm. um, which means I've got to hit four winners now, and I have to win a match hitting winners all the time. Well, who can do that? It's it's, it's too hard. Yeah, and I think so, people yeah. usually don't realize that even like Federer and Nadal, Djokovic, they actually have very good margin when playing. When yeah, playing. even though it looks like they're taking a risk, it's not actually. That yeah, I once saw um, Gasquet and Federer at Wimbledon playing um, playing a half volley set. So basically, they just played points only hitting half volleys. I, I couldn't believe it. And then when you go and watch them play a match, it looks like a really easy version of what they were just doing on the practice court. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing in a, in a controlled match situation, they're extremely comfortable when they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Um. What, from when you started coaching, maybe, or going to tournaments um, up to now, what do you think have been the biggest changes in terms of the game and even the coaching, let's say, for yourself? Um, I mean, you know, I, I, think that, I think that players move better now. I think, that, I think, I think they're, they're, they're quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, and it means if you're behind the ball that quick, then you can, um, you know, you, you can do a lot more. I remember, especially in women's tennis, the changeover from someone like Arantxa, Arantxa Sanchez, and then you see the Williams sisters come along. Yeah. And the Williams sisters suddenly hit the ball big from anywhere on the court. And Arantxa Sanchez is, is not missing, but she's not really able to to get a position where she's going to ge generate and if she does she's taking a big risk whereas venus williams was just hitting the ball down the line just normally and it would end up being a winner out of out of, out of, out of nowhere so obviously you know those two girls two sisters changed with miss tennis and that was seems to be the biggest change maybe the men's game has been a bit more gradual um uh, over the years but you know big serves and big forehands you know, have made a you know a huge difference, and and you just players now just completely dominate points, and depending on what your great asset is, you use it to dominate the point. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're Karlovich, then you know it's pretty simple what you do. Um, if you're um, Djokovic, then you hit perfect targets for three or four balls in a row until the other guy can't yeah. make position. Um, if you make position. <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, and if you're an adult, you just hit just such unbelievable kick off your forehand that it's just it's not really very playable. Um, so they all dominate the point, but just in different ways. And in terms of coaching, the way you were coaching when you started, or maybe ten years ago, let's say, and the mm. way you're coaching now, what would be the biggest difference, or? I, I, well, I mean, in terms of the game changing and 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 tactically, what's going on? I guess there's there's different things that have that have kind of moved on. Um, in terms of my coaching, you mean, and how I mm -hmm. approach it. How you um, well, um, hopefully, I'm a lot less naive um, with dealing with players and dealing with teenagers. I spend yeah, a lot right. of time. Well, I think when I first started working with teenagers. I thought I knew what I obviously want them to do. And I'd say, right, do this. And um, when they kind of wouldn't do it or it would get argumentative, I'd wonder what was going on. Um, so I've kind of learned to be, over the years, a bit more patient. Ollie probably won't tell you that. But um, uh, <laughs> um, a little bit more patient, maybe a little bit more forgiving. And... Um, and understanding what's, what's going on and also understanding that everybody is different. I know there are kind of girls and boys um, 
you can make generalizations about their difference, yeah. but actually everybody is, is different and, and getting to know them and, and how they operate is, is, is crucial. Otherwise you can't, you can't work with them. How are they different? Let's say boys and girls at that age. Teenage girls. Um, I think that, um, uh, I could say, you know, you can make generalizations, um, but everybody is different, but maybe if I start making generalizations, um, girls tend to be on the practice court, a lot more disciplined about the detail and do it. Take, for example, they're, they're more than happy to hit, you know, cross court backhands for a longer period of time and, and get the detail right and get comfortable doing that. Boys, can get bored with that very quickly and just want to play points. Um, and the, on the flip side, girls sometimes, especially, I used to have a squad of four girls, um, they wouldn't necessarily be that happy about playing competitive points against each other in practice. There'd because be a little bit of urgent about it. Because they were rivals, then they knew each other. Um, and so sometimes they wouldn't be that crazy about playing points and they'd like to do more drilling. Um, Uh, whereas the boys, what they want to do is play sets, play points. Um, and obviously they have to do more than that. But, um, but I, I guess that, was the, that would be the, the main difference between the boys and the girls. But having said that, you know, there, there were some girls that I know that just love to play points all the time. And there are some boys that, you know, get edgy about it. So, you know, it's... But have, uh, uh, have teenagers changed from 10 years ago, let's say? Yeah. Yeah, I think they have. I think I think I think I think uh, teenagers have got have got younger. So um uh, an 18 year old now feels younger than an 18 year old was 10 years ago if that makes sense. Well, less, less, less mature, I think. They seem to be a little bit a little bit um um less mature. Um in terms of in terms of how they're coping um with with everything um let's say just i mean i wouldn't want to point anybody out but but but, but in terms of it's different the situation let's say yeah situation so um and say coping with um coping with with matches so um there might be a girl who who's um at a tournament and um you know isn't playing well mm -hmm. and um sometimes i might even fake an injury because they're, okay. they're scared of the competition and afterwards they might really take the loss you know really badly um in boys it kind of manifests manifests it's, 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 it's uh in the sense that they their emotional control can go mm -hmm. a lot, a lot quicker. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it seems, it seems to, it, it seems to be, I don't know, there seems to be something where they're, they seem a little bit younger than maybe their, mm -hmm. their years are. Again, it, it's a generalization because yeah. there'll be some people who are very mature and some people who aren't. And, but I'm just taking over a big kind of spectrum of, Because I've dealt with a lot of teenagers. What do you think? Sorry? What do you think uh, that has to do with? Where does it come from? You know what? I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure it's not a tennis thing. I don't think it's a tennis thing. Um, I, I think it's just a, a, a society thing. But I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on why. I just noticed it. I remember thinking about this just a couple of years ago when, when, when meeting new people. And thinking that they were, um, when they, when you spoke to them and you just chatted with them, um, I thought they were a few years younger than they were. Mm -hmm. It's because of the way they kind of um, came across. Um, I don't know if that's anything to do with you know social media or life at school. Life at school's different. I don't so know. Is that... Having... Yeah. Yeah. In a weird way. What doesn't seem to make sense is that it feels like teenagers are under more pressure than they were before, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that has an you know has an effect. Um, so I think they're more. Or... 
I think they're more stressed. I think I think they seem to be more stressed out at, at school, um, and then you know that goes into you know panic about um, you know in tennis. It's am I going to be good enough to do this? Am I going to be good enough to then do this? Am I going to be able to to go to college? And you know, so there seems to be um, there seems to be quite quite stressed. And, and where is the stress being put on them? I don't really know. Maybe it's them putting it on themselves, the expectation of thinking, well, so-and-so has done this, so maybe I ought to be able to do it as well. Yeah, I think we probably compare <laughs> compare ourselves to other people more now than we used to do. Probably. Yeah, because it's so accessible, isn't it? All the information about everybody is so accessible. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe that is. Yeah. And basically that's why – you've even changed the way you're you're coaching now that you say you have more patience because you don't they're they're younger now so you have to give that benefit of a doubt yeah and, and i think you're always trying to get you're always trying to get the best out of someone for that moment and um if there's you know if there's too if you're too kind of dictatorial if you're too kind of if you're pushing them too much then you don't get anything back so it's a bit counterproductive so you have to try and, you know, kind of just tease the best out of them that you feel like you can for that moment. Let's say generally speaking, I I think it's something that a lot of people know that in, the interest in tennis has gone down in the last mm. years, let's say. Yeah. Um, why do you feel like that might have happened? Do you say in the UK or worldwide? Worldwide. I think it's uh, it's the case unless unless uh, we're talking about a country that let's say has a very promising uh, tennis yeah. player, you know, sure. and people yeah. and kids start playing tennis because of that. But I think generally the interest is kind of has been going down in the last few years. Well, it's interesting because I think you kind of you you, you hit it there. You know, go, if you think back to Germany with Boris Becker and Steffi Graf. And then suddenly, you know, the, the interest goes 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 up, and there's a kind of a, an accessible figure. And we've kind of been looking for that as well. But I think in in what countries like you know, Italy and, and obviously Germany since the 80s and France as well have done very well is that tennis is at a very high level domestically. It's incredibly high, and they don't really see futures tournaments as international they're kind of domestic events now for them international tournaments start with start with challenges really that's where it really gets serious um and uh and and, they, and their, their tournament structures are incredibly strong you know from juniors um through to seniors all the money tournaments and i think competition for me is the you know is the most important thing and it's 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 your starting point for everything else that you're that you want to do so unless your tournament um environment is incredibly strong then you're always going to have less players the less tournaments you have the less players you'll have mm -hmm. and then it starts to peter down from there um uh, and internationally um you know there's all this the over the last couple of years people have been talking about not enough prize money and in uh, in lower events and you know the reality of it is, is is that's true if people can't afford to do it then then they can't afford to do it so do you think in the UK, let's say, because um, I've heard a few people saying that once you, you turn maybe 16 or more so 18, in the UK, you feel like you're in this uh, limbo, like you don't know what to do, where to go, mm -hmm. what um, are out there for you and options. Do you feel like that's the case? Are there not enough tournaments for 18-year-olds to play or... Yeah, I mean, it's senior tournaments. So you would say, really, senior t tennis for players should kind of start at, at, at 16, really. Mm -hmm. And if that's domestic, then then fine, you know, from British tours um, 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 upwards. But yeah, I mean, we, we need way more uh, tournaments um, than we have. And we need a, you know, a club league with a, you know, a, a, with a much bigger prize pot. Um, and I think that... Um, Going to places, I've been to a lot of academies in 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 in, uh, in Spain um, and um, in uh, Italy as well. And these academies exist because, for example, if you go to somewhere like Barcelona, mm -hmm. um, back um, the, when I went there, 
um, with some players uh, probably about 10 years ago, you could play up to, you know, 200 in the world, 300 in the world, without having to go more than about 20 kilometers because there's so many tournaments and all the futures events had prize money draws for the, for people who lost in qualifying. Then you just go into a prize money draw and they were week in week out. Um, any of the junior tournaments um, had prize money in them. You know, it's just, it was just incredible. So you're thinking, well, yeah, no wonder they're going to Spain because the, the competitive opportunities are just never ending. It's, so it's, fun, it's fantastic. Let's say maybe here it's a matter of, of money or not having uh, the infrastructure yeah, yeah. for that, or it's just mentality, maybe or culture. I don't think I don't think I don't think I don't think we're short of money in terms of putting tournaments on. That's that's not a problem. I think it's more of a kind of a political will to do it, and how and maybe how the LTA feels that 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 tennis is going to improve. Because not only do you want like the top player, but you want a whole base of players that are good. And I think there's a feeling that uh, having an ambition as being 500 in the world mm -hmm. is not an ambition. You shouldn't you shouldn't pursue it. Well. Someone's going to be 500 in the world, and a lot of people would be very happy to mm -hmm. to achieve that. And there are lots of guys um, driving around France in camper vans uh, at 500 in the world, you know, earning a thousand pounds a week playing tournaments. So, um, uh, and, and 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 it's important because it means you create an enormous base of standard that then really good 14, 15 year olds suddenly have to battle their way through. Do you feel like um, it doesn't happen? Do you feel like is it still it's still viewed as a recreational sport tennis and less of a chance to by be the, performing yeah. something in tennis? I think probably by the general public. I think that by the general public, it, it probably is. And and you know, tennis is basically two weeks a year, isn't it? You know, on grass. Um, that's that kind of, that kind of their view of it. But obviously, people who play tennis and even people at tennis clubs, as well as parents of good juniors you know they realize i think people realize enough what the pro circuit is and what people do traveling around the world um i just think they know a lot less about i'm a club player and then there's professional tennis and the gap between us seems so enormous that there's no point even trying to bridge it but but knowing what all those steps are and maybe you'll get halfway through the steps and then you'll take a side step to play college tennis or mm -hmm. whatever it is. But but there are lots of steps and you can do them. Not necessarily here, but um but you but you can do them. Um what's your take on playing, let's say deciding to play college tennis and then coming back to performance tennis? Is that a way of doing it? Absolutely. Uh, and and it can be a very good way of is doing it. Is that an efficient way of doing it? Um, uh, you know, not necessarily. I think um, uh, I think college tennis was very big uh, in the states in um, the seventies and kind of early eighties, um, and then there was a real the, when Bolateri's really took off, and then other academies took off in uh, in the states. That seemed to be the way forwards. Um, but actually, college tennis never went away. Um, and then in recent years, they've cracked down on um, the clearing system because colleges in America have a lot of money to spend on their sport. And um, uh, I remember I think Texas AMT at one point had a million dollars, you know, to spend on their on their tennis team because they had televised basketball, they had tele televised football. Um, Nike were paying them, you know, ten million dollars, whatever it was. So you know. They were able to spend money, and, and the sports below basketball, baseball, and football in America are track and tennis. So those sports benefit an awful lot. Um, but they were taking players off the tour almost to, to play in the team, and of course that's not the spirit of you know amateur sport in America. So you know the NCAA said, look, that's a bit naughty. So we're going to do the clearing system, and so it made it a little bit difficult. So then I noticed all the American coaches going off to ITFs in Europe and then trying to recruit yeah. players off the junior yeah. off the junior bracket. And then there was a lot of Eastern European players who were trying to make top hundred ITF without any intention of turning pro. They just want to try and get into an American college. So you can see how the whole business kind of 
shifts yeah. sideways and, and moves along. So and it's just down to opportunities. Would you encourage one of your players to do it and then go into playing? To go to America? Yeah. To, you mean to go to America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you can get into the right college and you sit, you sit well in the team, then it can be a real benefit. Um, I know an awful lot of situations where it hasn't gone well and they haven't got on with a coach or they haven't got in the team or they've been sidelined for whatever reason. Um, so it, it really isn't for everybody. Um, and it isn't, you know, the answer to your, to your problems. The Brit British university tennis has improved enormously. And I'd really like to see an awful lot more go into British university tennis because that means come the American term time, the British tours won't get weaker. They'll stay strong because we want our tournaments to be strong, even though as an individual, you want to go to a British tour, you want to win it. So you might think, oh, if it's weak, I can win. But actually, yeah. you don't want that. You want it to be strong. The stronger, the better. We'll have more uh, um, players playing the county, the county week. In yeah. The and in county the week. week. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, you know, all the, all the county cup competitions, the stronger they are, the better it is for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so all the, all the competition, would, you know, we'd like it to be, to be stronger. Uh, going back a bit to the idea of um, tennis academies, let's say, because you've been yeah. to a lot, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's say, do you believe uh, in tennis academies or would you – advise one of your players to take that route? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a tough one because um, I was having this conversation today as a guy that's that's come over from Turkey. Um, um, well, actually, he was at Sparta Prague and then they've, they've come over to the UK um, and they've been talking about um, academies and they've had ex experiences that weren't, that weren't too good and they feel like the academies were a business rather than rather than anything else. And I, it reminds me of the story that a, a Spanish guy was telling me that, that in Spain, when they had the banking crisis and the academies were closing down, the mid-range academies were closing down. The big ones were surviving and the little ones were actually doing okay as well. And there was a player who was probably, you know, sort of sixth or seventh on the list at a, at a big academy. And he left to go to a small one where he was the best player by a mile and he got treated like royalty. So, so he he played the game really quite quite well. I thought yeah. because he was getting everything that he needed and all the and all, and all the treatment he wanted, and he could travel here and there and come back and and get the help he wanted because he was you know smart enough to use it. And I think sometimes players go somewhere where they're the weakest player and they think, well, I'm going to be with all these good players, mm -hmm. so that means it's going to be great. But actually, they don't get any help because they're not a priority. Yeah, plus so I think the confidence kind of suffers at that point. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. But academies can be, because when we talk about, the, you know, top pros that are at this academy or that academy, mm -hmm. the reality is they're not based anywhere. They'll go to an academy for two weeks and then they're off somewhere else like a tournament. So they're just yeah. dropping in with their own team. They're not really based at these academies, although academies would like to tell you that, this player is here and we're, he's here 30 weeks of the year. And if you come here, yeah. you'll be, you know, you, you'll be on the next court to him. Yeah, I'm asking um, because I think there's this, um, let's say, it's kind of a myth uh, amongst even coaches or parents and players, let's say, that if they go to an academy for two weeks or for a month, all their problems, tennis problems are going <laughs> to get solved. Wouldn't know? that be great if that was true? That'd be brilliant. Yeah. No. That's, that's, yeah, I'm afraid yeah, that's I, not. Like you said, they don't actually realize that even the top players, they don't train there. No. Year round. No. And it's interesting, the players, the very good players, when you, when you were traveling around the, with the ITFs and, and Tennis Europe, is the really good players had their own program. They had a personalized program, whether their family were running it or they had a, you know, a coach. Or a, it was usually often a family. We used to travel with Matej Pavic, and his older sister was a player. And, you know, that was the team. They travel around and, and me and Ollie, you know, were with them a, a lot of the time. And, um, uh, and, and many other players as well. They had a little, you know, a little team of maybe, you know, one family member and maybe, maybe a coach if they were lucky, they could afford it. Um, but they weren't really necessarily based at, at any academy. Mm -hmm. Let's say, um, talking about a parent that has a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 
what would be the steps that they would have to take into account in terms of what their child should be doing next? Right. I mean, it obviously depends what level, what level they're at already. Um, but if they're a, uh, if they're a, a 17 year old and let's say they're what you mean, top 200 ITF perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Then they've got quite a few options because of that sort of level. Um, clearly an American college would be, would be after them. Um, probably, you know, reasonably good, maybe a division one college. Then, um, also, uh, especially if they're a junior, I once had a guy that played in a German club as a junior, but he got quite a bit of money because he played in the junior team and the senior team at the same time on a double deal, which was very, very good. Um, and then, at that, and then you're thinking to yourself at 17, um, I don't have any points yet, but I might get a point soon. Um, and then if you go to Italy, you realize that, well, if I'm top 800 ATP, top 800, 700, I could probably earn 50, 60,000 euros a year playing money tournaments um, and Syria A league. Um, and that's 800. Now, when you're kind of 16, 17, and you're worrying about having to be top 200 in the world ATP, it's kind of scary. But if you think I have to be top 800 in five years time, maybe you think, yeah, do you know what? That's not, that's, that's doable. I yeah. could, I could manage that. Um, and then, yeah. And then you've got a bit more of a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. So these, these kind of manageable gaps of rankings are important because it keeps your motivation going and you think, yeah, I can do this and I can, I can have a, maybe it's a short career or, but I can, I can manage something rather than just kind of snuffing all my kind of dreams out. At 16, because at 16, I'm not going to be top 100 in the world in 10 years' time. A, you've got no idea. Uh, and B, it, it seems like a, a frightening kind of yeah. gap yeah. to try and jump. What would be the difference between a player that's 800 in the world, that is 500, let's say, and then maybe 250? Um. Well, winning matches to start with, I think. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I, yeah, I think that um, it comes in kind of – there's, there's two things that happen. When I first started kind of going to challenges and watching w watching those guys, um, they fell very much into two camps. You had guys who were about 6 feet 10 that mm -hmm. were hitting – you're hitting an ace or an unreturnable every other serve mm -hmm. and were not very good from the back of the court – or you had guys that could chase everything, everything down. Um, and uh, there was, um, there was a, do you remember a guy called, guy called Kenny DeShepa, French player? So he made, his best ranking was about 60 or 70 in the world. And he was, he came back from an American college and um, he was about six foot eight, six foot nine, something, he was quite a big guy. And, um, he played Ollie when Ollie was 14 in the futures qualifying in France. Mm -hmm. Now, Ollie was about five foot two, <laughs> and Kenny DeShepard was enormous. Um, Ollie couldn't get his surf back, obviously, but actually only lost three and three because Ollie was not that far off him from the back of the court. Mm -hmm. um, and this guy who just came back from college, who was clearly a very good player, you know, then went on to make top 100 in the world because his serve was, was pretty, pretty good. Um, so you, so at that level, you either got guys who have an enormous weapon, usually a serve, or they can just chase endlessly across the baseline and make everything. And from there, let's say you break the top hundred, and yeah. from the to top fifty, let's say. Yeah. Th then, then you're talking. To, yeah. Then you're talking about guys who it starts to get difficult to work out what they can't do. Mm -hmm. um, they'll have things that are ordinary, but no one really in the top 100 has got any major weaknesses because if they did, you could exploit them straight away. Okay. Um, so they'll usually have a weapon, a big weapon that they rely on regularly winning points with, and then everything else is pretty solid. Mm -hmm. And then as you move into the top 50, those weaknesses suddenly become... Um, a little bit stronger and the weapons are still very very big um, 
but the weapons don't think change that much from from 100 to, to sort of you know top 10 in the world and then by the time you get up to the best three players in the world everything they do is a is a weapon you know mm-hmm. they just it's almost almost unplayable mm-hmm. and in terms yeah. of women's tennis is it the same do you think yeah i think so i think the i think the women's game has, has improved i think the women's game has improved more than the men's game has um uh, you know, like I said, the, the Williams sisters were the, the, the catalyst for this. And then, you know, Sharapova comes along. And these girls just hitting the ball so hard um, from the back of the court. And I think if you put them on a cross court with the guys, I don't think there'd be that much of a difference. Because some of these girls can hit the ball pretty big. Um, and I think the difference maybe slightly comes when they're chasing the corners. Mm-hmm. And the guys can get into the corner and they can still you know, deliver and they can still hit the ball big and maybe the girls have to defend a little bit more um, from the corners, which is then why girls will have to stand up on the baseline and hit backhands from the middle of the court more Mm -hmm. um, because they want to chase the corners, Um, whereas the guys will stand back and run around and hit big forehands because they back themselves to make the corner if they have to. Um, um, But, yeah, no... Why is women's tennis so volatile in a way? Apart from the few that have dominated, let's say, but in general, is yeah. it down? I think, because if you go back, again, if you go back to kind of, you know, Navratilova, for example, maybe Steffi Graf a little bit after, after that, um, you had players that were dominating all the time. Because I think if you went down to 100 in the world in women's tennis, it wasn't, it wasn't strong. But now the woman who's the number 100 in the world is pretty good. And so you've got the sudden strength all the way through, Mm -hmm. which obviously you have in in men's tennis as well. And I think if you were to take, you know, um, uh, Federer, uh, Nadal and Djokovic out of the equation, um, I think you'd probably see the same in in men's tennis. You know, the the, the, the swapping over. Three or four in the men's. In the men's, I mean, who knows? But it's been quite, it's been, it's been very strange, hasn't it? In the last kind of 10 or mm-hmm. 15, well, Nadal's won that many French Opens, is not he? So 20 years, it's been extraordinary. Um, but may, yeah, maybe what somebody will suddenly become way better than everybody else and stay there for a long time. But everybody's so good, I don't know how they're going to do it. Who would be your best bet in the men's and then in the women's to do that, let's say? In the men's? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I think I think uh, maybe Team is the one that's kind of come through first, but I think he's he's older, he's more experienced, yeah. um, and he's got he's got he's got used to to what he has to do to win. Um, uh, Medvedev has obviously had a very good year. I'm not 100% sure about him mentally uh, in terms of longevity. Um, he he looks to me like you can kind of get under his skin, but then he used to be able to do that to Djokovic as well, and then that changed. So you know, maybe you know, maybe he'll 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 prove us all wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, no, there are a lot of guys there who look who look impressive. I mean, Rublev. Rublev's forehand is a scandal, isn't it? I mean, they just seem to be hitting it harder and harder. And in the women's? Um, in the women's? See, like, cause this is the general reaction yeah. in the women's somehow. It's, like, very difficult to pick someone. Why? Yeah, I know. Then we had the French Open, didn't we? And, and, and um, uh, you know, suddenly there's there's... There's this new surge of of tall, big, big hitting. But I almost feel like in the women's, it's, it's kind of not over. There are players that we are slightly off the radar that are feeling 12 months' time are just going to shoot through. Mm. Um, and maybe also junior tennis for women and women's tennis is a lot closer together. Junior boys yeah. and men's is further apart. So it takes... Mm. Takes, takes takes further. So, yeah, I think w- women's is, in a way, it's probably is a little bit more kind of interesting, isn't it? Less predictable. Yeah, true. true. Um, cool. Because you've got all these girls that, that, that are so good. 
Who's your favourite tennis player? At the moment, or of... Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's, it's, it's hard to look, at the moment. It's 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 really hard emotionally to look past Roger Federer, um, because uh, yeah, he just he can make stuff look incredibly um, easy. Um, but I really actually like when I'm when I'm coaching, I'm talking about players. I always use Djokovic because he's just so textbook the way he the way he works on the court. And we're always working on patterns of play and target hitting. You know, if you're if you're good at hitting targets two or three balls in a row, you don't have to necessarily hit an enormous forehand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it helps, but you don't have to. But you have to be good at hitting targets. And and he's shown that you can you can really dominate the court without this enormous backhand line or this mm -hmm. massive inside out forehand. Um, uh, do you do you think it's become more of a pattern type of game, tennis? It's just that it's just that because tennis is improving all the time, you have to keep finding ways of being better. So how much harder can you hit the ball and not miss? You yeah. know, you wonder. So if that's the case, then you better make sure that you're hitting the corners. So for example, in junior tennis, I still see junior tennis at a very high level. Um the first two or three shots in a rally are hit up in the middle of the court. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, you know, if you're playing a challenger, you'd lost a point on the second strike. You can't hit the ball in the middle of the court unless you're going to hit the baseline mm -hmm. at, you know, 80 miles an hour. So, um, you know, the ability to, to hit targets, I think, will improve, mm -hmm. um, you know, for sure. And I, and I think the better juniors have become a lot better at doing that. Um, and if you can keep doing, I remember um, Zerev when he was playing. I saw him play Rahampton when he was, I think he was number one in the world at the time, junior. And um, he was incredibly controlled, and he was very good at hitting hitting his targets. Um, his backhand was was really really accurate. Um, and uh, even though he could hit the ball big, he could actually hit the targets, you know, pretty well. And I think that combination of a great ball strike and a great target. Um, with a little bit of pace as well, um, makes makes all the difference in the world. Does hitting targets, um, is it more important, do you feel, in the men's game, or is it as important in, in the women's game? Or as I, think both. I, think, I think both. I mean, you could maybe argue and say it, it could be more important in the women's game because, um, you know, the girls are hitting the ball now really hard, and... Um, their move, so Sharapova's movement into the corner, um, you know, comparatively wouldn't be wouldn't be say as good as the as the as, as the top men. So if you're hitting, if you can hit three corners against her, you know, she's struggling to do that. The trouble is, she hits the first ball before you do, so you don't you don't get a chance to hit the corner. Yeah. That that's that's the thing. Um, but if you can, if you can get, if you can hit the corner first and then hit two more, then yeah. I think, it, I think you could say, you could argue and say it was almost more important in women's tennis. What's your take on changing the, the matches from five sets to three sets and playing short sets even in some of the tournaments? What, what do you think of that? Oh, what you mean in men's tennis? So going from, in the slams, going from five to three. Um, I think it'd be a bit of a shame, actually. I kind of like that five set battle. Mm -hmm. um, and being two sets down, and then suddenly something and somebody comes. I think it has something that the other form tournaments don't have. So I kind of I quite like that. I mean, maybe not no tie breaks, but because um, otherwise you'd spend five days watching a match. But um, but definitely, I I do definitely um, like like the five sets. But do you think yeah. we're going to see tournaments where we're going to have to play, or they're going to have to play short sets and just. Um, everything that will be shortened, maybe because here, like in the UK, you're used to playing sets up to four, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure it's as common in other countries. Um, I think. I mean, they they, they tried. Them. Yeah, they didn't. They experiment with the next generation, didn't they? They yeah. they tried doing like that. I I think in it, I think it's a matter of convenience because tournaments are played over the weekend. You want to try and get a lot of matches in. Um, so I think there's a pl there is yeah there is definitely a place for it because it means there is there are more matches going on. Um, yeah, you don't want to make tennis too short, then it ends up being a tiebreak shootout. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, but yeah, I think there's a, a place for it, especially in developing junior juniors and in junior tournaments. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Yeah. Just a little bit from the parents' perspective, let's say. Um, where do you think um, there is a struggle, let's say, to understand their children or to support them or to help them make the right decision? Yeah. yeah. It's always a tough one with, you know, teenagers and then parents. And you, get this kind, you can get this kind of battle going on. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's it, it goes two ways. When I'm talking to, to the players, I'm always kind of trying to tell them that they probably wouldn't be doing what they're doing if it wasn't for their parents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have to have a kind of a, um, a, a good relationship with their parents because basically they're, <laughs> they're funding them. Um, and from the other side, it's just, it's, especially at matches, it's parents kind of understanding. So often I hear parents say, oh, why did he miss that? And why did they miss this? Thinking, well, they're probably under a lot of pressure. You're watching, everybody else is watching. And, um, you know, this, this, this stuff happens. Basically, yeah, it's just missing in practice. Well, yeah, practice is a, a slightly different uh, situation. So the, the, the parents understanding the players a lot more. I found that parents who have played, have been players or are coaches, tend to be the more quiet and sit back and reserved um, parents because they appreciate what's kind of going on on the court. And, and the, the, the tennis parents who are parents first and foremost so when they when their child comes off the court you know they're concerned about their welfare and you know hey, feeling happy hungry got some food mm -hmm. and actually they leave the chat about the match as a real afterthought maybe not even talk about it okay. that would day that or, the best, uh, or would that be the approach, sorry would that would, be the best approach uh, de definitely definitely mm -hmm. Because the, the, the thing is, whether whatever the relationship with the player and the, and the parent, mm -hmm. um, the player always, the opinion that they hold with the most worry is their parents' opinion. Okay, So whatever their parents said, you know, shoot straight to them. They might say, oh, we don't know what you're talking about. They might argue about it. But actually, they care about their parents' opinion more than anybody else's. Um, so what the parent says is, it's pretty yeah, it's pretty crucial, I'd say. Okay, so maybe keep the the questions for a little bit later, not straight after the match then. Actually, yeah, I just kind of, you know, go back to being the parent. And, How should that yeah. conversation happen, though? Let's say when they do have the conversation about what happened or how the match was, how should that happen? What type of questions? Could I, think, I think that led by the player. The, the only thing that, I think the only thing that the, that the parent can, kind of, can legitimately get into is talking about is talking about effort and talking about um, you know how much they're they're putting into the doing. You, I don't think you can really you know criticise the performance or the result what's going on. But if a child's going and really kind of you know taking it for granted and not really bothering and uh, yeah well whatever, then the parents could be thinking why are we doing this? You know <laughs> if they don't want to do it then you know. Yeah. Yeah, then that that's I think a legitimate thing to to, to talk about. Um, but if they, I've never seen a player who's getting really wound up and really upset on court who didn't care about what they were doing. So they really they really it's a bit like when players say it kind of makes me laugh a little bit when players say when they shout oh you're so lazy any yeah. players that say I'm lazy are not lazy. Um, because uh, they're, they're trying to find something to, you know, to criticize themselves for when something else is and going wrong. What they really mean is I'm incredibly tight, I'm incredibly nervous, and my feet feel like lead. Um, but uh, when a, a player is getting upset and shouting that they're lazy, they very rarely genuinely are lazy. Would you, are you in, let's say, favor of players expressing themselves on court, or even being frustrated, or... Are you more for being um, just controlled, keeping things in? And everybody's every, everybody's different, and I think that if your outbursts make you play worse, mm -hmm. then there's no point. In, there's no point in doing it. Okay. But a, a real good trick I learned uh, years ago that's incredibly simple but incredibly effective is that if you can do whatever you like and you can say whatever you like, 
but you can only do it after you've won a point. Okay. Okay. If you lose a point, you can't do it. But the deal is, if you win a point, you know, go Why for is it. That? Because it'll all it'll, it'll usually come out as being positive. It'll be it might be aggressive and it might be kind of fist pumping, mm -hmm. come on or shouting or whatever it is. But it, it'll come off being aggressive, and that can still be quite positive. The most damaging thing for a tennis player is is self pity, when they start going, oh no, oh, it's the end of the world and that's it. You know, that kind of self pitying is is way more destructive than 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 really getting uh, getting angry because anger starts first and then the self-pity comes afterwards and then the head drops and then the slow walk we've, we've all seen it happen mm -hmm. um, so yeah. exactly yeah. yeah so if you're if you're if you're allowed to have your outburst when you're winning a point mm -hmm. after you've won a point then it it tends to keep things in check a lot more are there a few examples that you you know of that let's say, have that outburst, but it actually works for them? Um, in juniors, generally speaking, no. No. Mm. Um, because they find it very difficult to cap it. So it ends up getting, it ends up kind of going over the top and, and too mm -hmm. difficult to control. Um, but, um, you know, as we know, and as you, if you ever see the documentary, Ollie was, um, was, was very vocal. Um, and... Uh, Uh, it's an awful lot of things, but once he calmed down, which he can do it incredibly quickly, mm -hmm. he was back in there again. So actually, most players, when they, when they lose the plot, the match is kind of over. Or he could lose the plot in a match six or seven times, mm -hmm. and then bring himself back down to, to 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 earth again, and then and then carry on. Mm -hmm. um, it yeah. might have it might in the short term it might not be very good, but it didn't tend to be too detrimental for very long. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, let's say from the current players? Um, I think I think uh, with the current players that I'm working with, um, fortunately, they tend to be fairly controlled. Mm -hmm. I say that to more than any rackets and offences. But, um, but yeah, kind of fairly fairly controlled because it's, it's an ongoing dialogue, isn't it, about um you know how are you going to be effective because at the end of the day you're trying to be a match winning machine mm -hmm. and whether that's about serving or whether it's about you know keeping things under control um so it's a constant um evolving so do they say stuff and shout yes but hopefully it's it doesn't um kind of go down a black hole and then disappear into the ground what's the thing that you find yourself working most on in We're generalizing again, but let's say with the players yeah. at this stage. Patterns of play. Patterns, patterns of play. Every, every day we do patterns of play, which, which, which ends up with points, but starts off with footwork, then turns into target hitting, then turns into patterns, patterns of play. And I um, think if you're... If, yeah? Sorry. No, no, no. Go. If you're, it's a bit like um, in football, practicing um, free kicks and corners set pieces so you're constantly rehearsing set pieces when you're watching matches um you know watching matches on tv if you if you watch really closely there are so many points that are identical to each other yeah. because players like to play the same patterns over and over again there's a lot of security in it and so it's a battle if we're playing each other i want to play my pattern but you actually want to play your pattern so if i get the first hit and i get to do mine if you get the first hit and you get to do yours And so we're always trying to impose our, our own patterns on, on the other person. So patterns of play are, are, are crucial. Just for people to, to like have a perspective, because I'm, let's say I'm thinking of the club players as well, right? They're, yeah. Uh, they're playing, and I think a lot of them still focus on the technique quite a lot and not actually yeah. playing a match mm -hmm. at the point. Um, yeah. How would you say that it's, actually about patterns and tactics and how much is it about technique yeah i mean well, when you're ready to play a match yeah i mean again um if we're talking about you know an immediate goal over the next kind of couple of weeks mm -hmm. if we're talking about someone who's 10 or someone who's 30 
it, it's different, isn't it? So it depends on what your kind of your aims are. But obviously, when you're very young, you've got to get all the shapes together so that they're automatic and they're moving. Well, let's patterns. say when you're when you when you reach the point where your technique is good. It's, it's, okay, it's good. Um, it's good. Then. Right. I think, I think, I think, and you're right. People do obsess about technique, even when they're very, very good. And when you do that, it detracts away from playing. So the more you think about how you hit the ball, I've lost count of how many players I've known over the years who think that the better they hit the ball, the more points they're going to win. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it ends up being, you know, the more you do that, the more you hit the back fence. So um, accept what you've you've got for the moment in time, and then use use what you've got. You can improve it. You know, in your kind of off time, in your off competitive time, um, but when you come back to you know competitive phases, really you're trying to be as efficient as you can with what you already have, rather than rather than going backwards. Keep your focus on the other side of the net, on what's on where the ball's landing, rather than actually um, actually how you're hitting it. Well said. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just to I think we'll try and end with that. But um, yeah. with a round of uh, quick fire questions that everyone has oh, to go. Oh, yes. Marmite. Yeah. Oh, no, great. Right. Go on. Yeah? So you're also uh, the last well, I like Brussels sprouts as well, but yeah. uh, I love Marmite, so yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not surprising that you coached Ollie then, because that was his <laughs> favorite. Yeah. Um, your number one strength is a player and then as a coach. So say that again, my number one? Strength as a player and then as a coach. As a player, probably serve, mm -hmm. um, and uh, as a coach, um, um, my kindness and understanding. I hope by now. Yeah. We'll, we'll wait for some comments later on. Yeah, well, yeah, you might get a few. <laughs> Who would you pick as a doubles partner? Um, as a doubles partner, at the moment, at the moment, probably Joe Salisbury. I think probably, mm -hmm. yeah. Favorite film? Favorite film? Oh, favorite funny film? Probably Life of Brian. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, other films? I'm a bit obsessed with JFK because I'm into into reading about that assassination of JFK. So oh, yeah, I'll say JFK. Favorite book? Um, again, um, a, a lot of that kind of factual kind of um, political intrigue I like. So I've, I'm, I've just finished another book about about the Pentagon. Okay. Uh, yeah. Summer or Christmas? Um, again, I like both. Um, but, yeah, Christmas. But I, I wouldn't like an eternal winter unless I could ski all the time, of course, which is different. But, yeah. Favourite Christmas song? Oh. Favorite Christmas song? That's a tough one, isn't it? Um, probably the Pogues, Kirsty McCall. I quite like. Uh, Fairy Tale of New York, yeah. And favorite Christmas film? Oh, uh, that would have to be "It's a Wonderful Life." Night in or night well, out? Well, at the moment, it's definitely night in because I, I haven't been out since last March. So, um, so, uh, oh, am I losing you again? Oh, you're back, you're back. Um, yeah, I guess the night in at the moment, yeah. Phone call or text? Phone call. I mean, it takes me about five minutes to write two words on a text message, so um, probably phone call, yeah. Country you'd move to? Um, when I first went to Australia, to go to Australian Open, I loved it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a long way away, though, but I, I love Australia. And if you wouldn't have been a tennis player and a tennis coach, what would you have been? Um, I would have probably, I don't know, probably moved to a ski resort and stayed there for as long as possible, mm -hmm. doing whatever job they'd let me do. Okay. Okay. Well, that's it. Thank you. Well, it's good to talk. For, for accepting to do this. Found out some really no interesting problem. No stuff. problem. And hopefully yeah. I'll be with you in person soon. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll be able to go through some county matches together. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.